Go ahead. All right, let us uh, repeat the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. holy. Six, Six days, days of thy labor, labor and do all thy work. work. But the, the seventh day, seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, Lord thy God. God. In it, in it thou shalt not do any work. work. Thou, thou nor thy son, son, nor thy daughter, nor thy, daughter, thy, nor thy servant, servant, nor thy maid nor thy cattle, nor thy, nor thy, cattle, cattle, nor thy, nor thy stranger, stranger that is within thy gates. For in six, six days, days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and, and all that in the midst, and rested the seventh day. day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed Let us also repeat John 3 16, which says, For God so loved the world, the world that he gave, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, him should not, not perish, perish, but have that everlasting that life. life. For God so sent not his Son into, into the world to condemn the world, the world but that the that world, that world through him might be saved. Amen. Okay, now we do have a children's story, but first I want to know if we have any children out there online. If I can't find any children, we'll move the program on without the children's story. Hello. All right, we got, yeah. got Alex there. Did I see a green? Yes. I heard a green from here. Mom, just let me see what they see. All right. It looks like you got enough. Okay. It looks like we have to have a children's story then. Oops, here it comes. Share screen. This one. Share. Yes. Snowy Day by Ezra Jack Keats, an animated storybook. One winter morning, Peter woke up and looked out the window. Snow had fallen during the night. It covered everything as far as he could see. After breakfast, he put on a snowsuit and ran outside. Snow was piled up very high along the street to make a path for walking. Crunch, crunch, crunch. His feet sank into the snow. He walked with his toes pointing out like this. He walked with his toes pointing in like that. Then he dragged his feet slowly to make tracks. He found something sticking out of the snow that made a new track. It was a stick. A stick that was just right for smacking the snow-covered tree. Down fell the snow, plop, on top of Peter's head. He thought it would be fun to join the big boys in their snowball fight. But he knew he wasn't old enough. Not yet. So he made a smiling snowman and he made angels. He pretended he was a mountain climber. He climbed up great, big, tall, heaping mountain of snow and slid all the way down. He picked up a handful of snow, and another, and still another, and packed it round and firm, and put the snowball in his pocket for tomorrow. Then he went into his warm house. He told his mother all about his adventures while she took off his wet socks. And he thought, and thought, and thought about them. Before he got into bed, he looked in his pocket. His pocket was empty. The snowball wasn't there. He 
it felt very sad. While he slept, he dreamed that the sun had melted all the snow away. But when he woke up, his dream was gone. The snow was still everywhere. New snow was falling. After breakfast, he called to his friend from across the hall. And they went out together in the deep, deep snow. And that's how the story ends. Uh, we do have praise and worship for you today. It's a special treat from four years ago. I think you'll recognize the people in this praise and worship. And you can sing along if you want to. Hang on. <laughs> Let's see, where did I put it? It's playing hide and seek with you, huh? Oh, oh no, I got it. Gene's admitting people to the room. Just getting set up to share again. All right. Two computers running here. Share this screen. Yes. <laughs> That's where you want it. You don't want that little thing. I hear you, Fitz. Here we go. I lift my head.
we just want to sing how great he is. marvelous things, marvelous things.
touch my heart like you do. I can search for all eternity, Lord, and find there is none like you. There is none. There That is what you call a blast yeah. in the past. If you're getting nervous, it was pre-recorded from four years ago on February 15th, 2020. Amen. Amen. Yeah. This election. And we're, all we're all virtual today. Nobody is in the church. Amen. Amen. Have you come to praise him this morning? Are you come have you come to Praise him because there is none like him. How great is our God. We want you to prepare your heart for prayer this morning. We want to remind you that uh, you can place your prayer request on the uh, chat line. Also in uh, on Facebook. So prepare your hearts as we usher into God's presence with our needs and our concerns. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning thanking you, Father, and praising you for what you've already done. Father, we are asking this morning that you would bless each and every one that is on this prayer line. Father, we pray that you would bless them, their homes, their family. We pray that you would keep them in your care. And Father, we pray that you would be in in all our situations and circumstances, whatever that we're going through, our Father, we pray your presence will be with us, whether it be in our finances, in our homes, in our relationship with one another. We are praying, Father, that your spirit will guide us through all our situations. And Father, we pray for our sick and shut-in. We pray, Father, for Kathy's mom, Father, we pray for her recovery. We pray for Stephanie, and we pray for Fitz and his family. Uh, we pray for Verda, who is recovering from back surgery. We pray, Father, for our children blanket. Bless all the children that's under the blanket. We pray, Father, for our Macedonia prayer list, all those prayers that are listed. Father, we pray that you would bless them. Father, we pray for Nick, Mercentini, and 
and Lou Sapp. We pray for Val and her mother, Ruby. And Father, we pray for um, Joyce and her friend, Sandy. Father, we pray that you would continue to heal. We pray, Father, for Valdez, God's son, Matthew. Father, we pray that uh, that he will recover from his uh, situation. And Father, we pray for uh, Jean Jeanette's aunt, uh, sister. We pray, Father, that you would uh, be in her presence. Father, also, we pray for Neil and his sister. We pray for Brother Mark, Father, that you would bless and heal his, his brother Earl and his brother Seymour. We pray, Father, that you would comfort his mom as she uh, dealing with the health of her sons. And Father, we pray for my daughter, Deanna, and, and, and we pray, Father, for her healing and protection. And we pray, Father, for her pregnancy. And Father, we pray uh, for my little granddaughter, Journey, Father. And, and Kyle, we pray, Father, that you would keep them all in your care. We pray for my mother-in-law, Moody, Father, as you uh, continue to uh, keep her in your care, Father. And I pray for my dear bride that you would uh, continue to heal her and, and bless her. And Father, there are so many, and all those that are in the chat line, Father, all their prayer requests, Father, we pray that you would bless them all, those on the Facebook, Father, all those that are in need of prayer, Father, we know that we have a God who listens to all our cares, and we know we have a God that cares, Father, and so, Father, we pray to you this morning that you would be uh, a loving Father, that you have already uh, have already done. And Father, we thank you for the blessings of yesterday. We thank you for the blessings today. And we thank you for the blessing that's soon to come. And so, Father, we also pray for our pastor that you would bless him. And, and Father, we pray for all those who are still uh, traveling. We pray for traveling mercy, Father. And Father, as we always do, Father. We pray for the speaker of the hour. We pray for Elder Clarence Munn as he brings the word. We pray that the word that you have given him will be will fall on open hearts and help us to draw closer to thee. And so, Father, we thank you and we love you. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We'll have a special music and after the music, the next voice you will hear will be from Elder Clarence Munn. Amen. Amen.
Hallå. Can everyone hear me? We hear you. Yes. Yes. Amen, amen. God has really blessed us with some tremendous talent and always grateful for what God has done in our lives. So glad you took the time out. We'd like to thank everyone who's tuned in and to virtual um, worship. We're so grateful for your presence and we just thank you that God, have, that you have carved out a moment in time to hear the word of God. Let us just have a, a small word of prayer as we begin our worship service and in our, our sermon. Eternal and gracious Father, we just thank you once again for your many blessings. And we ask that the man that stands before you today, that you have allotted for this service to speak to your people, bless him and use him for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. As you can see, I've entitled my message more than meets the eye. I was always excited and I always enjoyed reading the scriptures about the man who was born blind. His story is found in the book of John, the ninth chapter, beginning in verse one. The scripture says, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was born blind from his birth. Now I want to pause here just for a moment that so that we can understand that it was Jesus who saw the man first. For the Bible says, and as Jesus passed by, he saw a man that was born blind. Then his disciples asked him saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, I was puzzled by their question because I wanted to know how could someone sin in their mother's womb? I mean, after all, they were born, or rather, he was born blind. So why did they ask that question? Why did they ask, did this man sin if he was born blind? Or his parents? Was this a, a, a rhetorical question? After all, they should have known all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So maybe they were implying that his parents was greater sinners than others. Brothers and sisters, too often we look at others and what they're going through in life and we ask the wrong question because we're looking for a reason instead of a solution. When we look at others through the eyes of sinful flesh, we ask the wrong question. Instead of asking Jesus who sinned, they should have asked their miracle working God, Lord, Will you heal this man that was born blind? The question is not what has he done, but how can we help? It seems that in every generation, we don't, we don't have a problem expressing sympathy, but mm -hmm. our problem is we struggle having empathy. Empathy, in my view, is a step above sympathy because it's putting yourself in that person's shoes. It's imagining what life would be like if you were there, if you were blind. What would your attitude be like if we lived in a world of darkness and every day of our lives, if our world was without shapes or colors, how grateful would we be if we couldn't see but had to imagine what things look like. 
a world when running is too dangerous and every movement is slow and careful as you feel your way around. Brothers and sisters, there's a spiritual lesson that Christ wants us to understand as we ponder the life of this blind man. If the truth be told, we are all born blind. We are all walking around like a blind man. We, we are all walking around in our feelings. That's the problem with this world today. Everybody is in their feelings. We trust in our feelings. We make decisions because our feelings, because of our feelings. We don't go to church because we don't feel like it. We refuse to speak to coworkers or hate our boss because we feel they disrespected us. We'll snap at our children and tell them to shut up and be quiet because I don't feel like being father today. Every little thing that people say or do, we explode emotionally because it's hard to live a peaceful life when everybody is in their feelings. When you're spiritually blind, you walk by feelings and not by faith. Without God in our lives, we live a dark and bitter life, a life filled with fear and anxiety. That's why as Christians, regardless of what we're going through, regardless of what people say or do to us, we must learn to lift up the God of our faith and not our feelings. The disciples mentally examined this person's life and felt like he did something wrong. We have to be careful how we mentally evaluate people, making judgments about what we see and not by what we know. Jesus said, judge not according to the appearance but judge righteous judgment. They asked Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents? And, and Jesus said, neither have this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be manifest in him. Now, I don't know about you, but when Jesus said, neither have sinned, I didn't know what he meant by that. So I said to myself, it must be more than mystia. Jesus wanted us to know that sin wasn't the reason. He wanted us to know that God had a purpose for his life. God had a purpose for our life. And even if it's blind, and even if he was blind for a season, even if our storm lasts for a season, would we be okay? if God gets the glory from our pain? Would our soul be satisfied if Christ wants to use us as the trophy of his power to heal and make whole? Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, for the night cometh when no man can work. Brothers and sisters, as Christians, we need to take Christ's words to heart. We need to live in the most, because we live in the most crucial time in Earth's history. A time where every Christian in America has the freedom to worship God. The freedom to buy and sell because there's no opposition today to our worship. This is the time to surrender completely to God, to study his words and to allow him to write his laws in our heart. This is the time to resist 
the pleasures of this world and get to know God and love him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Whatever sacrifices we must make to commit to God, then we need to do it now because the night comes when no man can work. Even as I speak, dark forces are aligning themselves against the people of God. And according to Revelation, the 12th chapter, verse 17, the dragon was wroth with the woman, the church, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Who is the church of God? It is they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is not the time, brothers and sisters, for TV worship, for iPad worship, for Facebook worship, and all the while we neglect this book. The night cometh. No man can work. So as Jesus was passing by, he saw that was a blind man, that this man was blind from his birth. He saw a man that society had discarded and often neglected with, uh, and often rejected. And with no insight, no idea, this man had no idea that his life was about to change forever. The world may have seen him as weak and broken and making no contribution to society, but Christ saw more than meets the eye. Jesus looked at the blind man and says in verse five, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. I want to pause right here for a moment just to say that God can do more with spit than all the medical science and all the medical degrees that men can accumulate. God can do more with spit than anybody you know in your life because God is able with man it may be impossible but with God all things are possible his power to heal the sin sick soul is as easy for God as spitting in the clay but if we try to heal ourselves it's as hard as trying to make a blind man see the Bible says, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leper his spots? Then may ye also be do good that are accustomed to doing evil. So he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay and said unto him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seen. Everyone that stood by was astonished to see a man that was born blind, now miraculously can see. But not everybody was shouting. Not everyone was praising God. Now that the blind man can see, here comes all the Christ haters. When the man was blind, they had nothing to say to him. But now that he can see, now they want to have a conversation. We need to understand that as Christians, that once we have been born again, we can expect some opposition. We can expect people to question our faith to question our decision and willingness to serve God. The Pharisees began to question him, but they didn't realize that he was a changed man. They didn't understand that not only had his natural sight been restored, 
but the eyes of his understanding had been opened. He's now more than meets the eye. Christ had been revealed to his soul. He has now a, he was now a chosen vessel, willing to spread the good news of what God had done in his life. And if the truth be told, he didn't even have to say a word. Just the way he walked was a witness. Every step that he made, people begin to question, is that the man that was born blind? He was willing to tell everybody that asked that Jesus was his healer. And even though he didn't know the 2300 days prophecy, even though he didn't know the state of the dead, but he was a witness for God because of what Jesus had done in his life. So when the Pharisee tried to discredit Christ by saying, this man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath. And again, they said, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner talking about Christ. We know that this man is a sinner. And now the man that could now see had enough of this foolishness. And he said, whether he's a sinner or no, I don't know. But one thing I do know, whereas once I was blind, now I see. And then the man said, do you want to be his disciple? And they reviled him and said, thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. Don't put that on us. We're never going to be Christ's disciple. We're Moses' disciple. Disciple, we trust in Moses. We don't trust in this Jesus. We know that God spoke unto Moses, but as for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto him, Why? Herein is a marvelous thing that you know not whence he is. And yet, he has opened my eyes. Now, we know that God hears not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, I'm going to repeat, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. He's preaching to those who should know better, who should recognize God when he sees him, who should recognize that this man had power beyond any one that ever stepped on this planet, and yet they doubted him. And they answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sin, and thus you teach us. Listen to the pride in their hearts. You dare, you think you're going to teach me? You're going to teach us when you were born in sin? And they cast him out of the synagogue. When Jesus heard that they had cast him out, when he found him, he said unto him, dost thou believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment, I am coming to the world 
that they would see not my see, and that they would see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, are we blind also? Their conscience, you understand, began to bother them. Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. If you would acknowledge and admit that your understanding of how the Messiah would come has blinded your mind, if you repent and be converted, then you will have no sin. If you admit that you were wrong, if you can admit that you were blind guys and leading the people astray, then you would have no sin. The enemy of all that is righteous have blinded you into thinking that you see, but in reality, you're blind. That's why the Holy Spirit said in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, that if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not, least the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine unto them. Oh, how clever and skillful in deception Satan is, that he can blind religious leaders. He blinds them with tradition or into thinking they can see, but they are truly blind. And according to life science, there are more than 45,000 Christian denominations globally. And every one of them believe that they can see. Well, how do you know who's blind and who can see? How has God given us a word that can break down the false religion to the up to the true religion, and it's found in the book of, of the Bible when he says to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. To those that believe that they can see but reject the means through which alone. You could receive sight. Your sin remaining. Remember when you reject Jesus, you really rejecting the word of God. For Jesus is the word made flesh. The Pharisees didn't understand that the knowledge of God was being revealed more perfectly to them. But in this very revelation, judgment was passing upon them. Their character was tested. Their destiny determined. Without God, darkness prevails. Without God, the world gropes around in darkness, searching for they know not what. Remember, blind people form images with their imagination. And if you are a sinner, then you will pervert your imagination and use it for evil. During the time of Noah, God said that every imagination of the thoughts of their heart was evil continually. When Trump lost the, at the 2020 election, he used his imagination to come up with the big lie which means he rejected the truth and came in covenant with Satan, the prince of darkness. In other words, without God, darkness prevails. Jesus said that he that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So now we can see why God chose this blind man because he saw more than meets the eye. 
He saw a man that would not hesitate to tell his story to all that would hear. He saw a man that was fearless and would not be intimidated by men of status, but was willing to speak truth to power and was willing to worship and follow Jesus regardless of the cost. Who would have imagined that this man would one day see God? Imagine, if you will, what his life would have been like if it wasn't for Jesus. We can all bear witness of what our life was without God and how it has been changed dramatically with God. Without God, Moses was a murderer and a fugitive from Egyptian justice. But with God, he was able to bring the greatest power on the planet to their knees. Without God, Rahab was a harlot who lived a shameful life. But with God, she is named in the family and lineage of Jesus. Without God, some of us would still be in the streets with no hope of eternal life. But thank God we listen to that calling. Come unto me, all ye that labor in the heaven, laid it out and give you rest. First Corinthians, the sixth chapter said, Know ye not that unrighteousness shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor infeminate. You need to look that word up, infeminate. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And then it says something that I love. He said, and such were some of you, but now you are washed. Now you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of Jesus Christ and the spirit of our God and by the spirit of God, God. We used to be out there in the streets, but look at us now. We are leaders, and some of us are leaders in the church and followers of the living God. We are members of the household of God. And like David, we don't, we're not caught up with um, titles. David said, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. My Lord has made such a change in our lives because every time he looks at a sinner, he don't look at the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. And when God looks and saw us, even though the world may have seen a drunkard, God seen more than meets the eye. Even though the world may have seen a harlot, God saw more than meets the eye. Even though the world seen a cheat and a drunkard and, a, and, 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 and one that never feared God all of his life, and yet God seen more than meets the eye. Brothers and sisters, we thank God for his many mercy and his grace that he looks beyond our faults and sees our needs. Let us pray, eternal and gracious Father. We are so grateful that you don't judge us by our outward appearance, but your focus is on our hearts. We thank you for your your mighty glaze and that your willingness to change whosoever believeth in you. 
We ask, oh God, that you'll continue to use us and bless us to this end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 What a word. What a word. I know God's word has found a place in your heart. But let me say this. What I like about what I just heard, that God can do more with spit than all the medical establishment in the world. So we are we we are in good hands and we are and we have eyes that God has opened up and we thank him for it. I hope you enjoyed the message. It was a powerful one. I love it. But as we uh, continue on with our service, I want to remind you of our, our tithes and offering. Uh, you can go you can pay online at our Macedonia website or to the conference website. Also, you can uh, drop your tithes and offering into the mailbox. Remember, no cash. And also, um, you can call an elder or deacon and, and have your uh, tithes picked up. So let us remember what God has, how God has blessed us and how he has kept us in his care. And so they're going to be... Um, a short intermission with an announcement. And after that short in, uh, intermission, we will have our Sabbath school by Elder James Hayes. So uh, let me do the uh, benediction now. And following the benediction, we'll have our short intermission. Father in heaven, we, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the word that was heard. We thank you for praise and worship. And Father, we we praise you and we worship you and we thank you for all that you've already done for us today. We pray, Father, that you would bless each and every one that is on this that is on this service call. Bless their families, bless them with good health, keep them in your care. And Father, those who are our traveling father we pray for traveling mercy all these things we pray in jesus precious name may you be blessed may god keep you in his care now and forever amen amen um uh next um uh, happy uh, sabbath amen so this is our next portion of our uh, zoom encounters worship service today uh sabbath school um so I'm excited about it. It was a great lesson this week. It talked about the um, just if we go through the lesson, we see just how uh, of a, a vast, big God that we serve, you know. And it talked about the different aspects of it. And again, just to recap, we talked about the book of Psalms. You know, we're going through Psalms this quarter, and the, uh, the Psalms can fall into various categories. They're praise and worship Psalms. Uh, they're historical Psalms that talked about the history of God's dealing with the children of Israel which we can mirror and pattern out our own lives. There are lamentations and mourning songs. Uh, there are songs that talk about God as uh, the king. And I like when we're going to get to the lesson this week and we talk about how God reigns. And I think we often forget that we serve a God that who he is. He, he's the king. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. In fact, this week's lesson is entitled, The Lord That Reigns. The Lord That Reigns. So let's get started. Father in heaven, we're grateful for this nether aspect of worship, uh, starting with the power hour this morning, the divine worship, and we're so grateful uh, for the word that you gave us through, um, gave us through um, Elder um, Clarence of this morning, and Lord, we are praying that now as we get into uh, this message that you have, or the Sabbath school lesson that you have for us, we ask that the Holy Spirit will illuminate our mind with wisdom, with knowledge, and with understanding. So we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. So we got scriptures that we're going to go through today, so I'm going to ask for volunteers uh, to read for us. But our, our memory text that says, Psalm 93, 1, it says, The Lord reigns, he is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. And the world is indeed, and the world is established, firm, and secure. So we want to jump right into it. Can I get a volunteer to read Psalms 8, 1 through 9? Psalms 8, 1 through 9, and then someone else reads Psalms 100, 1 through 5. So I need two volunteers, one to read Psalms 8, 
verses 1 through 9, and then Psalm 100, verses 1 through 5. Thank you so much. O oh Lord, our, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than it, the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have, you have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Thank you, Elder Johnny. And the person who's going to read Psalm 100, 1 through 5. <clears throat> Excuse me. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Man, thank you, Sister Jean. I want to read one other song right quick before we talk about it. Psalm 19, 1 through 4 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament show of his handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech, and night unto night show of knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is going out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them had he set a tabernacle for the sun. So when we put all these um, uh, different scriptures together, that's talking about God as the ultimate creator. And so the first question to the class is, what does it mean to you that we serve a God that is the creator? Notice I said, not a, but the, there's only one creator, you know, and that's the point that we need to begin with. Is God permanently establishing, establishing himself as the sole creator? There is no multiple creator. There can only be one. God, and matter of fact, he gives us a, the Sabbath day where we're worshiping on today as a reminder of who he is. And in the fourth commandment, he stuck, he he, he lays claim to the title of it. He says, remember the seventh day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath. So in that, in that, uh, uh, in, right in the middle of the, the 10 commandments, God has firmly entrenched himself as the, as the creator and gave us the Sabbath, the reminder of that. Uh, when earlier this week, when me and the, um, the wife were having worship with the children, we tried to paint to them a picture to them and to ourselves of just how vast and big of a creation God God has and, as compared to you and I as individuals. So obviously you have gone to a beach yourself before, and when you go to the beach, what do you find there? Grains of sand. You know, you have sand. And, and so I told them to imagine one tiny grain of sand on that particular beach, be it we were, uh, we we're still in South Carolina at Myrtle Beach or we're over at Rehoboth Beach. But just imagine one particular grain of sand from that beach, and but all of the beaches in the world interposed together. That's how vast and big God's creation is. But as Uncle Johnny read to us, and, 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 and with you as one speck of grain in it, that, but when John, Uncle Johnny read to us Psalm number eight, when David was considered this, he considered God's vast creation. And he said, what is man that you are mindful of him? So we want to jump off to the, to the question this morning. Well, let's, let's try to look at that answer. What is man that God is mindful of him? Why is God so concerned? Again, now, mankind is only a, a, 
portion of his creation. He has a vast creation that we can't even begin to understand. When they go and do these telescopes, they can see these uncharted worlds that we can see, but there's so much so that they can't even see. And God is reigning over all of that. So the question to the class this morning, what is man that my, God is mindful of him in his vast creation? Let's throw that out to start off this discussion today. Anybody want to take a shot at that? Why does God, why in other words, why is God so concerned about man when he has a whole vast creation that we can't begin to comprehend? It appears we are the ones made in his image. <coughs> and as far as we okay. know, the only ones actually made in his image. Okay. Anyone else want to um, put uh, put a thought out there? Notice what it says, though. David asked, he said, <clears throat> what is man that you are mindful of? That means we're on God's mind. When God does something, he's very intentional about it. You know, this week I had a chance to boil my life down to really uh, it, the, the simplest capacity. I thought about it. And you probably have thought about it too. God is the reason why I'm here, meaning he created me. And God is the reason why I'm still here. He sustained. So when I put that one and two together, that I'm here because he created me, and I'm still here because he sustained me, I come up with only one logical conclusion that I should serve him. So God, so so what we're putting all this together is it's important for us to understand that God, even though we are a small portion, very, very small piece, think again, one saying of grand on all the beaches of the world combined, he was very intentional about making you, Uncle Johnny. He made you. About you, Tasha Map, about you, Nicole, about you, Elder Ellen. About you, Gene, about you, Steve. God was intentional about making you as one person in a speck of his creation. You were on his mind. And that tells me that's love, that's relationship. God, I mean, just think about his bad creation. We, I mean, we are one, we are one of eight billion people on the world, and then he has untold number of worlds. So you fit yourself as one person in the human world and then one person of untold number of worlds. But he had you on his mind. He was intentional about creating you. That tells you how special you are to God, how intentional he was. And see, it, it's important to understand that, that God is the creator because when you understand he is the creator, it changes your whole dynamic about life. You don't think that you were coming from uh, apes or, or you evolved or, or something like that. You know that God, you were created by an intelligent being who has a very intentional purpose for your life. That's what I like about that thought. Knowing that God created us gives us a purpose in life. That's right. It, it gives us a path to uh, live our life on. And so we don't have to be confused about why am I here? Uh, what shall I do? Uh, just knowing the creator gives us a purpose and in, in, in life and a direction in our lives. Uncle John, I'm glad you brought that up. I like how you said that. Because there's so many people out there today don't know what to do with their lives. I mean, I mean, how many of you have heard this phrase, especially on TV? <clears throat> I'm trying to find myself. You know, <laughs> but the reality is God made you for a purpose. You ain't just out here flying uh, by the seat of your pants. You shouldn't be. But in order to know that purpose, you got to be in tune. You got to be connected with this God. Let me read something to you from Sunday's pastor. We just getting started. He said, creation plays a crucial rule, role in the songs in upholding God's sovereignty. The heavens which we are, which are his handiwork, proclaim his glory and power. God's name is majestic in all the world and all the earth. The Lord has created everything. He has no beginning and he has no end. He is everlasting and superior to over gods of the nation 
which are only the work of men's hands. In other words, we serve a God that's bigger than anything that we can convey. And see, it's, that's why this is important to understand that God is the creator, because then it begins, then we can put our own situations in perspective. Let me explain to you. When we go through our issues in life, you know, and stuff can be overwhelming to us, you know, we can see like we get hit on all sides at one time, or as Uncle Johnny would use a, 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 a military explanation, we could be getting like we get hit with um with missiles and bombs and and they didn't open up the uh, the the, uh, the machine gun fire on us and but 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 when we realize that we serve a God whose resources are vast and unlimited, it should remind us to put our situation and look or should I say look at our situation in the context of God's immensity. So when I look at the complexity of my problem. They dwindle in the immensity of God. In other words, God, if this God is big, then he upholds untold worlds. What is my tiny problem to him? So whereby it may be overwhelming to me, it's very, very much underwhelming to him. So the Psalms teach us that God is our creator, and thus as our creator, He's responsible for us. Me and my wife have four children, three that are here, one that are in Florida. And we're responsible for them. Not so much the oldest one now, but we're responsible for them. So God as our creator is our responsibility. I mean, it's, God, it's his responsibility to take care of us. So the Psalms remind us that God is our creator and that he can and he does do a very good job of taking care of us. Amen. Let's go on a little bit further. Let's go to um, uh, Monday's lesson, talking about the, the Lord that reigns. And I want someone, if they will, will read the scripture for me. Can someone read for me Psalms 96? One through ten. Psalm ninety six. One. I'm sorry. Psalm ninety seven. One through twelve. Psalm ninety seven. One through twelve. The Lord reigns. Let the earth be glad. Let the distant shores rejoice. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. His lightning lights up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and all the peoples see his glory. All who worship images are put to shame. Those who boast in idols worship him, all you gods. Zion hears and rejoices, and the villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments, O Lord. For you, O Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Let those who love the Lord hate evil, for he guards the lives of his faithful ones and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light is shed upon the righteous, and joy on the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise his holy name. Thank you so much, sister. <clears throat> so closely tied to the fact that God is our creator is the fact that God is sovereign king. Now, when you and I think about royalty, you know, obviously there was a transition, I think, with last year when uh, King Charles, went, which he went from being Prince Charles to being King Charles after his mother, the Queen of England, passed away. And there was a lot of pomp and circumstances surrounding that. And often you and I forget that God is the king. Matter of fact, we refer to Jesus as the king of kings and lord of lords. So when you are a king of something, you have a kingdom. 
And when you are a king of something to have a kingdom, that means you do something, you reign. That means you are in control. That means what you said go. And I think we often forget. In other words, we, we, we make God common. Remember when Jesus came down, he took off his priestly robe. And he came down to serve us as a human being. But make no mistake about it. The angels understood who he was because they saw him in all his majestic splendor. They saw him in all his glory. And the Psalms remind us, the Psalms remind us of God's sovereignty. So the next question to the class is, why do we think it's so difficult or why do we make it so easy to make God come? And why do we forget? Because guess what? If you and I were going to a palace, we will be mindful of our behavior. We will be mindful of our attire. We will be mindful of our conduct and our children's conduct. Why do we treat the things of God as commonplace when God is a king and he reigns? That's the next question to the class. Mm -hmm. Anyone want to take a shot? What comes to my mind is the fact that by beholding, we become changed. And since we don't behold him in his glory, we haven't actually seen with our sight. We tend to follow along with those things that we do see. That's right. Every That's right. Day, daily basis. That's right. I'm glad you brought that up, Sister Jean. I'm glad you brought that up. You made a good point. By beholding, we become changed. So even though naturally, or we can't behold Jesus in his glory because he's an all-consuming fire. But when we are intentional about worship, and when I say worship, I'm not just talking about the worship we do every Sabbath. I'm talking about worship where we spend time alone intentionally with God on a daily basis in prayer and in his word. That's when we begin a glimpse of who he is and his sovereignty and his worship and that will translate in our lifestyle. That will translate in the things of God. So like Sister Jean pointed out, because we're not abiding in his presence, because we're not being intentional about worship, but because we're not beholding, we're not becoming changed, and thus we treat the things of God as commonplace. But when we study the book of Psalms, it reminds us, that God is sovereign and God does reign. Let me read the passage to you on Sundays, I'm on Monday's lesson. It says, the Lord's rule is demonstrated in his works of creation, salvation, and judgment. Get this. The Lord establishes his kingship over the whole world. God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. I like this part. It says it's unparalleled in power and majesty, the Lord's reign is established on mercy, justice, and righteousness, and it brings order and stability to the created world. So let's, let's put all that in plain English. You and I live on a planet that at, on its best day is in upheaval, on its best day. We are governed by corrupt governments, including the United States government, not just the United States. Every government has a sense of corruption in it because they're human beings in it. But God's kingdom, and let me back up, all these other kingdoms, well, let me back up a little bit further. You remember uh, in the book of, of Daniel when they talked about the succeeding kingdoms and they talked about Babylon and then talked about Medo Persia, then they talked about Greece, then they talked about Rome. But then they talked about there was another kingdom that would come up whose kingdom had no end. That was talking about the kingdom of God. You and I as children of God are part, even though on the earth standpoint, we are part of whatever uh, a country, you know, like the United States or whatever country we're from, or we may hold citizenship with. But as a Christian, we hold dual citizenship. We're citizens of the kingdom that's eternal. All these other earthly kingdoms with their corrupt um, in governments are going to come to the east. But God's kingdom is an eternal one, and it's unparalleled, and it has no God is sovereign and he reigns. And when we read the book of Psalms, it reminds us of just how much control God has. You see, we say, well, why is that important to me? How does that, what does that translate 
into my practical life. It means everything to you because you realize that you're not in this battle alone. I, I heard somebody put in the chat, uh, God's resources are vast and unlimited. So that means no matter what you're going through, it's not your problem. It's God's problem. You should place it in the in the midst of his sovereignty. Because remember that he's reigning. So he not only reigns over the good, he reigns over the bad. In other words, God ain't just interested in us bringing uh, uh, our praise to him. We can bring our problems to him because after all, he is the solution. So let's recap. The Lord created us. Sunday's lesson taught us. Monday's lesson taught us that God reigns. Let's go to Tuesday's lesson. God is the judge of the earth. Can someone read Psalm 75, 1 through 10? Psalm 75, 1 through 10. <clears throat> we give thanks to you, O oh God. We give thanks. For your wondrous works declare that your name is near. When I choose the proper time, I will judge uprightly. The earth and all its inhabitants are dissolved. I set up its pillar firmly, Selah. I said to the boastful, do not deal boastfully. And to the wicked, do not lift up the horn. Do not lift up your horn on high. Do not speak with a stiff neck. For exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. Amen. But God is our judge. He puts down one and exalts another. For in the hand of the Lord there is cup, there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is fully mixed and he pours it out. Surely his dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. But I declare forever, I will sing praises to, to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked I will also cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. So let's talk, let's recap. So the Psalms teaches that God is the creator. Notice why I said the, and there's only one. There's no a multiple creators. It teaches that God reigns. And remember, God has a kingdom. And what does a kingdom have? What does any country have? A kingdom, a country, in order to have rule in society, in order to have stability, a king or a kingdom or a country must have what? A system of laws. God is the lawgiver. And, 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 and God has a court system. Matter of fact, our own court system is undoubtedly based on what we understand from the Bible. God is the judge of all the world. God sits in judgment. And most of the time when we think about the word judgment, we start getting tense. But when you understand biblically, judgment is actually in your favor. To judge something simply means to render a decision. A few months ago, last year, I had to travel down to South Carolina because one of my sisters, she's in a nursing home and, her, and she no longer lives in her house. And her house is under the trust that I handle for her. Well, uh, earlier in the year, someone, uh, supposedly a friend of hers, decided they want to squat in her house without paying any mortgage and, that, and without getting authority from me. So I had to go through the legal system to get this person ejected or evicted. Now, when we went to court on November 7th, judgment was rendered by the judge. That is, the judge made a decision, and the judge made a decision in the favor of the trust that this person was to be evicted. Well, when we translate that to human terms, you and I are on trial because of our sin. But what do we also have in our favor? The Bible says we have an advocate. First John 1 John 1.9 said, in a man's sin, what? We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus is our lawyer. His blood is pled on our behalf. So the judgment that God renders is not negative. 
the decision that he renders on our in, in our behalf is 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 in our favor. So judgment is in itself is not a bad thing. To judge something means God renders a decision. It only becomes bad when we have neglected, and I emphasize that word, neglected to give our lives to Christ. God is a judge and he's looking to save you. He's not looking to convict you. Let me read something to you. From, and anytime anybody want to chime in, by all means, do so. I'm going to read something to you um, from um, Tuesday's lesson to kind of underscore that. It says, the Lord probes people's heart as a part of his judgment. It is, um, both texts show that the execution of God's judgment of the world <clears throat> is preceded by God's examination of the people's lives and get this, and seeking whomsoever he can save. Did you catch that? Now, if you don't get nothing else from today's lesson, please get this one. God is not in judgment seeking to who, he can, who he can destroy. I got to say that one more time. God is not on the throne, as we have been told, looking at people whom he can destroy. God is on the throne looking for people he can save. God is in the saving business. Hell was not meant for any human being to occupy. The scripture is clear. The hell was prepared for the devil in his angel. If a human being finds himself or herself in hell, it's by choice and not by rejection. God did not place or will not place, should I say, anyone in hell. Meaning God does not reject any of us. We reject God. And as a result, there's only one alternative. Do you catch what I'm saying? God does not look to destroy anyone. What the, the book tells us in Exodus, it says what? I'm not willing that any should perish. So when, when we think about judgment, that's not anything to fear. Judgment is actually God looking to save you. For a long time, I didn't understand that. The word judgment used to get me intense. But when I understood that God is actually looking to save me and not to destroy me, it changes my whole aspect. Now, to be clear, now, God hates sin. And he's going to judge sin. And those who have uh, 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 left to cover themselves will reap the consequences. But that's the key thing. You don't have to be that way. God has given you and I a way of escape through accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It, only a fool would reject Christ. Only a fool. And that's what the devil has planted us to be. Fools. Because we refuse to accept life-giving resources. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to life eternal. God wants to save us. All right. I like the I like the idea <clears throat> of God wanting to save us because without by him giving us his Holy Spirit, his Holy Spirit helps to um helping this plan of salvation and in the teaching and guiding us on the path of righteousness. So I just thank God for his Holy Spirit because I realize in my own strength I cannot do right. That's right. I realize in my own strength I cannot defeat the battle that is going on in my mind. So I thank God for his Holy Spirit who he who he gives us to help us to uh, to win this uh, spiritual battle, to help us to be saved. Amen. And I'm glad you brought that up, Uncle Johnny, Elder Johnny. God is not looking for us. He knows we can't do it in our own strength. The devil tries to get us to fight the battle unequipped. But thank God he's given us the Holy Spirit to remind us that we can't fight this battle alone. And we don't have to. God has given us of his Holy Spirit to be able to do the job for us. But it's up to us 
to take that at hand. Let's move on to Wednesday's lesson. Ever mindful of his covenant. Can someone read for me Psalms 105, verses 7 through 10? Psalm 105, verses 7 through 10. He is the Lord, our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. The word he commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant he made with Abraham. The oath he swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree. To Israel as an everlasting covenant. Thank you so much, sister. <clears throat> So what's the basis of our assurance? God made a promise. You remember, let's go back to Genesis chapter 12, when he called Abraham out of the Ur of the Chaldees and told him to go to a land that Abraham knew nothing about. It was through that, and then what did he tell Abraham? He just said, it's through you that all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So that covenant promise that God made to Abraham and which flowed through Isaac and which flowed through Jacob and ultimately through the Messiah that would be coming from their loins, that same promise is the promise that you and I keep. In other words, God remembers the oath he made to them. The assurance that you and I have and that the book of Psalms remind us is just this. God promised Abraham to... Um, that he would save his seed, and you and I as Christians are part of the Abrahamic seed. It has nothing to do with being a, a, a natural-born Jew. No. The Abrahamic seed are those who accept it by faith. Remember, how, was, how did Abraham receive God? He received God through faith. So those who are blessed or who have faith are blessed with faith for Abraham. So as we come into the knowledge of Jesus Christ and accept him by faith, we take hold of that same covenantal promise that God made to Abraham. I want you to understand something for a moment. You don't get it saying That same promise that God made to Abraham is now been inherited by you and I. We are part of the inheritance. Let me read um, something to you from a uh, Wednesday's lesson. And by all means, anybody have a comment, a question, please jump on. It says, God's people are secure because the Lord placed his dwelling place in Zion and established his everlasting covenant with them as his treasured possession. God, God does not simply promise, get this now, God does not simply promise not to reject his covenantal people. He actively works to keep them secure in him. He forgives their sin. He instructs, blesses, and strengthens his people. God's judgments are given to turn the people to righteousness and demonstrate that he cares for them. So let me go back. Let me, let me package this up and, and say it to you in, in plain English. The promise that God made to Abraham was a promise that God makes to the church. That's what Zion is. Same promise. God says, I not only make this promise, it's not a promise simply not to reject you, it's a promise to save you. So I'm going to actively participate in your salvation. Notice what he said now. How did he do this? God became a man. Left took off his royal robe, came down to a planet to be rejected by a race of rebels, to die a criminal's death, to take your place, to secure your eternity. God was not a, uh, 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 they call them, what they call them, landlords that are absent lord, landlord. God was a very present landlord in Zion. His very presence in the church is an uncertainty or an assurance of our salvation. Let me say that one more time. God's very presence in the church is an assurance of our salvation. The only way you and I will not receive salvation 
is because we simply reject it. Not because God takes it away from us. He promised not to take it away from us. It was a promise to Abraham. But you must accept it and make it your own. Talking about kids. Yeah, go ahead. That would be. Oh yeah, if you go straight, like you go this way and straight down. Oh, somebody! Oh, somebody need to mute their phone. I thought someone was asking. Yeah, mute your phone, please. <coughs> Okay, so let's go to the next and last um, uh, section for the day. There is his lesson. I like this one. I liked all of it. Talking about the sure word of God. Can I read? have someone read for me Psalm 119, 165. Well, let's start with Psalms. Psalm, start Psalms 1, 1 and 2, and then Psalm 119, 165. So Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and then Psalm 119, 165. That'll take us home. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. Amen. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Thank you. And Psalm 119, 165. I actually have it out read. It says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend. So with Thursday's list talked about God's testimony or God's law. The reason you and I can find assurance is because we stand on God's word with Yeshua. I like Psalm number one, verses one and two, because it talked about the righteous versus the wicked. And in verse number two, it says, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and he meditates on it day and night. Now, we're going to link that back to what Sister Jean talked about uh, a few moments ago when she talked about... Uh, Beholding the beauty of the Lord. We behold God in his word, in his testimony. And as we do that, that same word translates us. It changes us. Uncle Johnny talked about it. He talked about the Holy Spirit aiding us in being oh. like him. So, so how do we put all this together? You and I can have that assurance. The book of Psalms helps us to have that assurance because God's judgment, God's reign, God's creative power, all of that is based off his word. And who is his word? Jesus is his word. Remember, Jesus is the word made flesh. Jesus is the word of God. The very word that you and I read about is Jesus himself. He's the word of God. God's word, God's promises are true. And you and I, in order to make that work, we have to appropriate those promises to us. You know, you, you heard the old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. In order for you and I to understand the, the, uh, the certainty of God's promises, we got to make them our own. Let me read this last passage to you on Thursday's lesson before we close out. Uh, let me get to my screen. It says, God, get this one. God vouches for the integrity of his promises and his commands. God's faithfulness is both wholly reassuring in guaranteeing the unchangeable character of his rule and wholly demanding in asking the people's response of trust and obedience to God. So let, let, me, let me make this in plain English to you. When someone writes you a check, that's not the same as cash. You have to go, uh, it's an instrument, a banking instrument that you have to turn over to the bank 
and it's converted into cash. But that check is only as good as the signature of the person that they have the resources to cover the check. So God is saying, my word in your hand is a check that I have signed. I'm vouching for it. And if you believe in it and stand on it, this word will see you to life eternal. But in order for that to happen, you and I must take the check. We must cash the check. We must invest time with the word, who is Jesus, to reap the benefits of the word. God has given you and I life today. It's up to us to use that life to appropriate eternal life. Amen. Father, Amen. we want to thank you today for allowing us to have some moment to uh, study your word in the Sabbath school. And Lord, we know you're the Lord that reigns. We know, Lord, that you're the Lord that creates. We know that you're the Lord that judges. And we know, Lord, that you are the Lord that keeps your covenant promise. And this is all based off the sure promises of your word. So, Lord, we're asking that you will use us today to receive these blessings, but not only to keep them to ourselves, help others with them. So we thank you and we praise you. Bless us as we continue through this Sabbath afternoon. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. 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 Our teacher. Amen.